Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Jean Blake and I am the CEO for Parkinson Society, British Columbia. Thank you for joining us today at our virtual Moving Forward Together conference. We hope you're all looking forward to the presentations from our expert speakers as much as we are. Before we begin, I would like to go over some tech information to help you smoothly navigate our virtual conference today. First, I want to let you know that we are recording the conference and it will be available later on on our website. To optimize your experience with the conference today, please ensure that you adjust your speaker volume both on your computer as well as on your actual speakers so that you can hear everything well. There's a few tips there to assist you. Um, if you do uh, experience any internet connection issues, please uh, check to see that you haven't pressed your speaker mute button on your keyboard. Um, and also you can try refreshing the page in your browser. Please close any other applications that you might have open. We have a chat box and if you navigate to the right hand side of the video view, you'll see the chat box that you can use to type in any comments or questions you may have. Both for staff, uh, if you're experiencing problems and also later on at the end of each presentation, we will have a short question and answer period and we can convey your questions to the speakers. Sometimes the chat box appears as a small blue box at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, it will expand. And at the very top of the chat box, you'll see a link for our virtual <coughs> exhibitor hall. Please click on this link during our breaks to visit the virtual exhibitor hall. There's downloadable educational information and services there from our participating organizations. So just before I um, introduce our first plenary speaker, We've been around now for a little over 50 years as an organization, and it has been our honor to serve and support British Columbians living with Parkinson's, especially during this most unusual of times in the last seven months. We've developed many online programs and increased our services to support the Parkinson's community to serve your needs. Our mission is to empower the Parkinson's community in British Columbia through providing resources and services to enable self-management, self-reliance, and self-advocacy. Today, our expert speakers aim to diversify your knowledge of Parkinson's. Our virtual exhibit hall will provide you with additional information and resources. At this time, I'd like to thank AbbVie for their generous support of the Moving Forward Together conference as our title sponsor, and also thanks to Synovian, our other sponsor. And now for the first plenary speaker of the day, I would like to introduce Dr. Anthony Lang. Dr. Lang is Professor and Previous Director of the Division of Neurology at the University of Toronto. He has published over 700 peer-reviewed papers and is one of the most highly cited investigators in the field of movement disorders. Among his awards and distinctions, he was elected by the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society as an honorary member in recognition of his extraordinary contribution to the field of movement disorders. He also received the Western Brain Institute International Outstanding Achievement Award for his work in accelerating the development of therapeutics for neurodegenerative diseases of aging. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anthony Lang. Well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my job this morning has is to bring you up to date on some of the really interesting and uh, important developments that have happened in the last 35 years um, in the field of Parkinson's disease. So trying to concentrate on the evolution of the definition and diagnosis of the, the disease. I have a number of disclosures that uh, is always important to acknowledge. Uh, this is a very active field now. Unfortunately, we have quite a number of companies uh, developing therapeutics that I'll touch upon, and uh, I know Dr. Stossel will be touching on some of these as well. So let's start from the beginning. 1817, James Parkinson, uh, a physician and a very interesting uh, and uh, eclectic individual, wrote this um, 
little monograph called The Essay on the Shaking Pal Palsy. Remarkably, Parkinson only described six cases and he only examined three of them. He saw three in his clinic and three he observed on the street. And despite that limited exposure, he described all of the essential features of the illness and the very famous neurologist in France, Charcot, 50 years later acknowledged that by naming the condition Parkinson's disease. And I'll point out so we can come back to this, the ownership or possessive uh, that uh, has often been used in describing diseases, Parkinson's disease. We'll come back to that concept late. Okay, so generally we know now that this is the second commonest neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease. It has a worldwide distribution, um, Europe and uh, North and South America being um, affected more than Africa and Asia. Uh, it is a disease that's more common in males, three to two compared to women. Uh, in the US, Hispanics are more commonly affected than non-Hispanic whites, Asians, and Blacks less often. Age is the greatest risk factor, although we know that the disease affects younger individuals. This is a disease that especially affects individuals over the age of 65, and the prevalence rises nearly exponen exponentially up to and beyond the age of 80. Despite its frequency and its um, recognition since the 1800s and even before, it was described in ancient Egyptian writings and in the Bible and other um, old literature. Um, we really, despite that long-standing recognition, we still don't really quite know how to define the disease. Is it a clinical syndrome that the neurologist recognized and recognizes, including its response to treatment, uh, that is typically associated with degeneration of a particular part of the brain that I'll show you, the substantia nigra compacta? Or alternatively, is it a syndrome that accompanies a very specific pathology that the pathologist recognizes under the microscope? Again, that I'll show you uh, demonstrating these inclusions called Lewy bodies. Or is it that specific pathology that then results in many different features, not just the features that the neurologist recognizes with tremor and rigidity, et cetera, that again, we'll talk about. So we still don't really quite know how to define it. So let's talk about the various approaches that we can use to define it. And each of these is challenged by this tremendous heterogeneity of the disease. So let's start with the clinical features. And we've recognized for quite a while that we need to reevaluate the clinical features of the disease and the Movement Disorder Society or the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society, importantly led by a Canadian, Ron Postuma, who was my fellow is now in Montreal and a number of us got together to create new criteria. But importantly, these criteria still rely on clinical assessment. It's a clinical diagnosis that requires the clinical features of Parkinsonism, rigidity, tremor, uh, slowness, so-called bradykinesia, the presence of features, as well as the absence of other features. And so we've concentrated on inclusion and exclusion criteria and red flags to warn us that maybe the diagnosis is incorrect. And the reason for this new approach to the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's is the increasing recognition over the last couple of decades that Parkinson's is not just a motor disorder, is not just rigidity and slowness and walking problems, but manifests quite a large variety of non-motor symptoms, neuropsychiatric like depression, anxiety, cognitive dysfunction, disturbances of sleep, the very broad recognition of the presence of rapid eye movement behavior disorder that I'll talk about in a minute, autonomic features, abnormalities of the so-called autonomic nervous system. This is the nervous system that controls a lot of automatic features like bladder function, blood pressure, bowel, constipation, uh, erectile function in males, for example. Sensory complaints like pain, for example, and restlessness, loss of the sense of smell being very common, and a variety of other features. So we've recognized the frequency, the in marked frequency of these non-motor features in Parkinson's that 
really force us to expand our concepts. And so there's been a long-standing attempt at trying to clinically subdivide patients with Parkinson's disease under a variety of subtypes. And this slide, I don't expect you to take it all in, but it just tells you that there are many, many different approaches since the 1990s all the way through to recently trying to subdivide Parkinson's into the clinical features, into the age of onset, into the speed of progression, for example, trying to separate rapid from slow progressive conditions, more benign features versus more complex features. Despite all of these attempts, we've really not been able to subdivide Parkinson's very reliably and consistently in a way that future studies find you can replicate. So despite all of these attempts, none of these have really been replicated in many different populations of patients with Parkinson's disease. So it's very frustrating that we recognize the clinical heterogeneity and yet we can't replicate it. What about subdividing on the basis of pathology? Well, I've told you about Lewy bodies, the inclusions of uh, what turns out to be this protein alpha-synuclein in the cells of the brain, especially but not exclusively, the substantia nigra, uh, substantia nigra compacta. This is the the black substance, substantia nigra, the dopamine nerve cells of the midbrain. And so here's a slice of the midbrain on a normal individual with a black substance, those dopamine cells containing a pigment called neuromelanin, compared to the loss of these nerve cells and the loss of that pigment in a patient with Parkinson's. So this is a control brain. This is a Parkinson's brain showing the loss of the cells in the substantia nigra. You see the depletion of those nice pigmented dopamine cells in a control brain. And these, the remaining cells have these inclusions that are a, a full of the protein alpha-synuclein. This is the alpha-synuclein stained with what's called immunohistochemistry, antibodies to the alpha-synuclein. And with those antibodies, we see quite a bit of pathology, not just the inclusions, but these um, uh, uh, projection, uh, uh, projections of the nerve cells, so-called neurites, Lewy neurites, as well as Lewy bodies. Uh, quite a diffuse amount of uh, this alpha-synuclein pathology that spreads throughout the brain. And so there's a lot of knowledge now that alpha-synuclein plays a critical role in the uh, progression and degeneration of Parkinson's. And this came from a recognition of a number of genes that are associated with synuclein as well as uh, immunohistochemistry of patients even lacking these genes. But it's also interesting to know that patients thought to have Parkinson's disease who clinically have all those features that I showed you before um, may not have alpha-synuclein pathology. And we've learned this in many ways, but learned it especially studying patients with genes that are known to be associated with Parkinson's. The commonest autosomal dominant disease associated with Parkinson's disease, LRRK2 is the gene, LARC2, is associated most often with the alpha-synuclein pathology in Lewy bodies, also Lewy bodies in the cerebral cortex, but Patients with the, the identical gene, this is one of the mutations associated with LARC2, the identical genetic abnormality may not have alpha-synuclein pathology, may in fact have what are called neurofibrillary tangles and another protein called tau, or even the absence of abnormal protein, just a sort of bland degeneration and loss of nerve cells. So you can have Parkinson's disease, we think Parkinson's disease associated with mutations in this gene, both with and without Lewy body pathology and alpha-synuclein degeneration. And we did a study with a large number of brains showing Lewy bodies or without Lewy bodies. This is a work from my colleague, Lorraine Callia, but with uh, contributions from all over the world. And we actually found that patients with and without Lewy bodies have differences. So those with Lewy bodies 
had more cognitive Im impairment, more mood problems, more anxiety, and more disturbances of um, the autonomic nervous system with a drop in their blood pressure when they stand up. More of these features than those without the Lewy body. So there is our clinical differences that need uh, further evaluation. So what more do we know about the disease heterogeneity? Well, I've already implied this uh, in my earlier um, comments that there are several genes, not just LARC2, but several genes that are associated with Parkinson's. And uh, we also know that there are a variety of environmental factors that may be associated with Parkinson's. And so there are many causes and we recognize that the greater the amount of genetic risk, the less environmental risk you may need and the greater the environmental risk, possibly the less genetic risk. So there's always an old statement that um, genes load the gun and environment uh, pulls the trigger in many diseases. And uh, in Parkinson's, we recognize that it's probably a combination of genetic risk with environmental risk that ends up causing Parkinson's in the majority of patients. And so there are many risk factors, but also interestingly, uh, uh, genetic, or I'm sorry, environmental factors that may protect against Parkinson's. You may have all heard the fact that people that smoke have a lower risk of having Parkinson's. Uh, maybe coffee drinking and non anti-inflammatory use and calcium channel blocker use may uh, reduce the risk. And so there are uh, risk factors that increase, risk factors that reduce, and then genetic factors in the same uh, fashion. And these interactions may be the uh, final features that predict or result in the disease in the majority of patients. There are many genetic factors that uh, result in Parkinson's. And um, this slide shows you what are called the monogenetic factors. So single genes that in isolation may be able to cause Parkinson's. You don't need to know the details. Uh, you might just scan the bolded underlined black uh, contributions. So there are a number, small number of monogenetic genes that are capable of causing Parkinson's alone. But these are uncommon and uh, we recognize that there are probably many other risk factor genes that contribute. And we now know by studies, uh, these are genome-wide association studies, that there are 90 independent and probably many more independent genetic risk signals alone, these are not sufficient to cause Parkinson's, but if you combine all of these genetic factors, you can actually create a genetic Parkinson risk score. And so people with a large number of these have a greater risk than people with a small number of these. And so uh, we're now seeing studies that will, um, try to predict the risk of developing Parkinson's based on your genetic risk score. But again, even with a genetic risk score that's high, that's probably still not enough to cause Parkinson's. It may be that your high risk score with other factors like environment may then, uh, like I said, pull the trigger and cause the Parkinson's. Okay, and then finally, there are many pathogenic mechanisms or cellular pathways that contribute to this heterogeneous state. And this is simply a list of many of the factors that you'll see in a variety of studies, research studies that contribute or thought to contribute to Parkinson's. Cellular clearance systems. Um, these are systems that get rid of abnormal proteins and abnormal mitochondria as they accumulate in the cells. As, as cells function normally, they gather garbage and your garburators need to be functioning to rid your cells of uh, abnormal um, functioning proteins and abnormal cellular uh, constituents that uh, then can contribute to the abnormal function of a cell. Um, mitochondrial, what we call homeostasis and dynamics, endoplasmic reticulum and calcium, uh, as well as inflammation, all of these factors can play a role and they play a role both independent of and secondary to that critical protein that I've told you about, alpha-synuclein. And this is a little cartoon that we've contributed 
to show that all of these factors in your cells, and again, you don't know to need to know all the details, but cells are complicated structures and they've got many different pathways that can, when they fail, contribute to cell death. But when they fail, they can contribute to the abnormal aggregation of that protein alpha-synuclein that then can trigger more abnormalities in these cell pathways that can both feed back to synuclein or in isolation may then further contribute to cell death. So we've got a very complex uh, array of abnormal cellular functions that interact and contribute to the final common mechanisms of cell death. This is a, um, a concept that is not unique to Parkinson's disease, that we have proteins in the case of alpha-synuclein, or in the case of Parkinson's disease, a normal natively folded alpha-synuclein. And then we recognize that for whatever reason, the abnormal protein begins to misfold. And that misfolded protein forms what are called oligomers. These are toxic species of the abnormally folded alpha-synuclein that then become folded and create fibrils. These fibrils then are the substance that form those um, synuclein uh, uh, abnormalities that uh, constitute the Lewy bodies and the Lewy neurites that I showed you of the picture of early earlier, and then we now recognize that the abnormal folded protein may spread from cell to cell. So we have this formation of the abnormal aggregates of synuclein that are called, that, that follow a, a pathway that is now called permissive templating. The abnormal misfolded protein encourage the formation of abnormal uh, protein folding uh, from the, um, from the normal protein. So the combination of the normal protein with the misfolded protein templates and creates greater amounts of these aggregates. And these aggregates then um, uh, accumulate in the cells and the cells may then allow the abnormal protein to spread from one cell to another, cell to cell transmission. And then these disturbances overwhelm the various functioning ways that the cells have of protecting themselves. They overwhelm the protective mechanisms and then these trigger a variety of other cell death mechanisms. So it's a complicated slide, but just for you to know that a normal protein misfolds, encourages further misfolding, spreads from cell to cell, and then overwhelms the various protective mechanisms within the cell and encourages cell death. Further than that, we know that there are a variety of inflammatory mechanisms that are occurring both in the brain and outside the brain. The brain has an innate um, inflammatory process. Uh, this involves cells called microglia and astrocytes. And then the adaptive immune system occurs outside the brain involving, you've probably heard this, T and B cells. Um, B cells, for example, forming antibodies. And we know that both the innate inflammatory mechanisms inside the brain and the adaptive immune system outside the brain are all involved in uh, Parkinson's disease, in, alpha, in uh, animal models, in toxin models, and in alpha-synuclein. And this is a nice little uh, cartoon that comes from a uh, paper, a review paper by our colleague David Standard in the States, who reminded us that both inside the central nervous system and in the peripheral ner nervous system, for example, in the gut, in the enteric nervous system, we can see alpha-synuclein that then triggers the innate microglial and the adaptive macrophage and uh, T cell um, activations uh, that then may encourage inflammation uh, both inside and outside the central nervous system. And David Sulzer from uh, Columbia also reported a couple of years ago that taking blood from patients with Parkinson's disease, he was able to find T cells 
that recognized alpha-synuclein peptides, uh, indicating the role of the adaptive immune system in Parkinson's disease. And you've all heard the potential importance of the role of the gut microbiome, and this microbiome may actually be playing a very important role in neuroinflammation and Parkinson's. And this is a really intriguing study uh, by uh, Sampson and their colleagues a couple of years ago in an alpha-synuclein overexpressing mouse, a so-called transgenic mouse that makes human alpha-synuclein. And I'm just gonna share with you this rather intriguing study where they took these mice that had a motor dysfunction and pathology. These uh, um, transgenic mice had evidence of inflammation and, and uh, motor abnormalities and pathology in the brain. If they treated these mice with antibiotics, they cleared out their normal microbiome, or if they raised these mice in a germ-free environment, they didn't have um, bacteria in their gut. So in two ways, with antibiotics or raising them in a germ-free environment, animals did not have active microbiome, active um, um, bacteria in their gut. And in, that, in these animals without an active microbiome, they did not find the pathology. They did not find active microglia that they felt was triggering the uh, motor dysfunction in animals raised in a normal environment or animals with a typical microbiome. Also interestingly, short chain fatty acids triggered the activation of these uh, disease competent microglia. So animals without the active microbiome don't have the pathology. Animals with the active microbiome had a motor pathology. And then interestingly, if they took the animals who didn't have the active microbiome, microbiome and gave them uh, Parkinson's disease-derived microbiome, so they put Parkinson's feces into the bowel of the animal who is germ-free, either antibiotic-treated or raised in a germ-free environment, and they got the enhanced motor dysfunction again. So all suggesting that a typical microbiome with the inflammatory process that is triggered by that uh, can encourage um, the development of a motor uh, dysfunction. Very interesting study that clearly needs to be uh, replicated. So with, based on all of this information I've given you so far, let's ask some important questions. Where does Parkinson's disease actually begin? Does it begin in the central nervous system? Or could it begin in the peripheral nervous system? I've already told you that the microbiome could be triggering or the inflammation in the enteric nervous system could trigger it. And this is very relevant in terms of what symptoms or investigations we should be applying to evaluate patients at the earliest possible stages of the disease. And this is a little slide to show you that we could find Parkinson's maybe in the salivary glands, or in the stomach, or in the colon, or in the skin, or a variety of other regions, we know that in postmortem studies, as well as living patients, we can find synuclein in all of these regions. So maybe it begins in these regions and then spreads to the brain. You may have heard of studies that have shown uh, taking um, uh, animals and finding evidence of spread to the brain. This is the most recent study, interestingly, taking Parkinson's disease Lewy body tissue, remember the Lewy bodies have the abnormal synuclein from a Parkinson's disease, and injecting it into the brain of a monkey. And they found that they could uh, demonstrate spread of the pathology in the brain of the monkey, but also spread from the brain into the peripheral enteric nervous system. However, so that would suggest that brain disease spreads to the periphery. On the other hand, these investigators injected that same Lewy body fraction of Parkinson's patients into 
the stomach and into the duodenum and found that it spread to the brain. So we now have evidence for what's called bi-directional spread. Maybe the disease spreads from the brain to the enteric nervous system, but there might also be evidence for spread from the enteric nervous system into the brain. So we've got a lot of work still to do to understand this. Then the question begins, or, or is, when does Parkinson's disease be, uh, begin? And there have been a variety of studies that have asked this question, and it actually depends on what you actually use as the evidence for having Parkinson's. For example, if you use this entity, rapid eye movement behavior disorder, you can actually argue that Parkinson's disease begins 20 years before patients actually present with the clinical features that we think are the manifestations of the disease. This is a sleep disorder where patients enact their dreams. So they act out their dreams based on the lack of the ability of the brain to shut off their motor behavior. We all have normal uh, brain functions that uh, reduce or, or shut off our ability to talk to our muscles in our um, rapid eye movement sleep when we dream. And so if you have rapid eye movement behavior disorder, you're able to act out your dreams because you lack this ability. And so there are many other symptoms that you could have that manifest early Parkinson's. And so Bill Langston drew, drew this cartoon many years ago to argue that it depends on who an individual sees that um, show manifestations of early disease. So a, a neurologist may examine the rigidity or examine the slowness or the tremor, but a gastroenterologist seeing a patient for constipation may see the patient many years before that, or a specialist in um, blood pressure or bladder function may see a patient with these features well before the Parkinson's patient does. And here's a sleep expert seeing the patient even earlier than that. And so we now recognize that the neurologist seeing these patients in the clinical features, diagnosing the patient with those features that I told you about, tremor, rigidity, akinesia, will see a patient only after those motor features uh, um, manifest, whereas we are now recognizing that Parkinson's has a very long prodromal phase, 10 or more years before the motor features uh, manifesting these features and more. And so we're hoping that we will be able to develop markers earlier, far earlier than the clinical manifestations uh, that then allow us to uh, define the presence of the disease much earlier. And so we recognize that Parkinson's uh, BRAC in his staging uh, really revolutionized our thinking uh, many years ago now. He staged the Parkinson's from one to six. The neurologist is only able to diagnose Parkinson's with motor features at stage three. But we now recognize that in the brain and probably in the autonomic nervous system, uh, the disease is present many, many years before that. And so Parkinson's disease is only the tip of the iceberg. Parkinson's defined with the motor features and under the surface, under the sea, is a much larger iceberg manifesting pre-diagnostic, pre-motor, pre-clinical, pre-physiologic. So this is the area that we may be able to diagnose Parkinson's far more earlier than we're currently approaching it. And the whole point of that is to recognize Parkinson's before it spreads up the brain into the motor features, the dopaminergic substantia nigra in Brax stage three and four, and then spread far beyond that into a disease that is well clinically manifest, but maybe far too late for us to initiate uh, protective, uh, successful protective therapies. Now, how good are we at diagnosing the disease? Well, we're not very good at diagnosing uh, early Parkinson's, but we're hoping that we're going to be able to do that earlier by recognizing these uh, prodromal features. And so the Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society developed research criteria for the uh, diagnosis of Parkinson's in its prodromal stage. 
This is a case that I'm just going to share with you to show us what, what we're talking about. And this really does tell us the importance of being able to diagnose the disease early on. This was a patient who presented to his physicians at the age of 69 with rapid eye movement behavioral disorder, the dream enactment, the acting out his dreams. And at that time, he had no clinical features of Parkinson's disease. This is the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale where we score the bradykinesia, the slowness, the tremor, the stiffness. He didn't have a scan of the dopamine system of his brain. He had no cognitive problems, uh, no cerebrospinal fluid abnormalities, really no manifestations that could give you a clue that he's got Parkinson's except his rapid eye movement behavior disorder. At the age of 73 now, he has a DAT scan looking at his dopamine system and it's entirely normal. So he doesn't have dopamine abnormalities in his substantia nigra. He's not at stage three of the dopamine degeneration that I showed you earlier. But he does have an abnormality of his cardiogram that shows that there may be an abnormality of the noradrenaline um, uh, neurons that supply his heart, which may be an earlier manifestation. Now at the age of 74, he does have an abnormality of the dopamine system, and he's got tiny, really questionable abnormalities on the physical examination. And he's now complaining of loss of the sense of smell. Two years later, he has some cognitive abnormalities and is considered to have mild cognitive impairment. And yet the motor scores on his examination still would never fulfill uh, criteria for Parkinson's. He's got a little bit of maybe slowness or stiffness, but nothing to constitute clinical Parkinson's. And now, almost 10 years after he presents with rapid eye movement behavior disorder, he still has no clear Parkinsonism. He's got lightheadedness when he stands up, so a suggestion that his blood pressure has dropped, and he's got some constipation, all suggesting that he's got spread of the pathology to other regions, but still not enough to cause clinical Parkinson's. Unfortunately, the man dies at this stage. And so the question is, what disease does he have? In fact, he doesn't have enough degeneration of the substantia nigra compacta to show Parkinson's. He's got 20 to 30% cell loss in that region you need to know that you need actually about 60% cell loss in that region before your dopamine cells reach a threshold of having any um, manifestations of Parkinson's. But despite that, he's got very clear degeneration. He's got very clear uh, Lewy body formation in that region. So this man actually does have Parkinson's disease, but it's prodromal Parkinson's. And so we really need to be able to diagnose the disease well before he would have presented with clear features of Parkinson's disease, but he still, still has Parkinson's disease. So how are we approaching patients in this stage to be able to make a diagnosis? We need more reliable, what are called biomarkers. And there are a lot of different kinds of biomarkers measuring proteins in the spinal fluid that might indicate inflammation, uh, dopamine markers uh, to suggest that the dopamine levels are low. But you need to know that there's a lot of interest in developing markers that are based on that pathological protein alpha-synuclein in the blood, the cerebrospinal fluid, in the saliva, as well as in tissues, skin, saliva glands, and gut. And I think this area is really being revolutionized by something called seeding assays. Now we're not gonna go through the mechanism of that. The two seeding assays that I'll just introduce you to are this, the PMCA and the RT Quick, the protein misfolding cyclic amplification and the real-time quaking induced conversion. And these are, really critical papers that have just been published this year by very important groups, Soto and uh, 
Hage and his colleagues. And these studies are really changing the playing field of Parkinson's disease. You might remember that idea that I showed you in an earlier cartoon, the permissive templating. Well, these studies are based on that concept of the ability of the abnormal protein to template the normal protein. And so this is now allowing us to diagnose Parkinson's disease at the very, very earliest stages, even before patients present with motor features of Parkinson's. And this is now in my mind, uh, the next revolution, being able to do a skin biopsy. This is just showing you the kind of punch biopsy we can do in the skin. Uh, this is in the limb, but I will show you that in uh, some studies, the skin biopsies in the neck, right behind the ear, for example, uh, are able to differentiate Parkinson's disease. These are living patients with Parkinson's from controls and even patients with that rapid eye movement behavior disorder from controls, even before the manifestation of Parkinson's and being able to separate Parkinson's disease patients from controls remarkably. This is a um, something called a rock uh, curve um, and showing that uh, almost 100% sensitivity and specificity. And so these studies being published in JAMA Neurology and uh, in the important journal, Movement Disorders, that are one of our next speakers, John Stossel is the editor, I used to be the editor of. And so these are hallmark revolutionary papers that I think are really going to change the way we approach Parkinson's. I personally think that a skin biopsy may be the way Parkinson's diagnosis is going to be made in the next couple of years. So let's finalize our discussion on how do we treat Parkinson's and what's changing in this respect. And I'm going to very quickly touch on these issues. Um, and Dr. Stossel is going to talk about some of the research. So the treatment of Parkinson's is subdivided under disease modifying or protective, treating the symptoms or restoring the abnormal cell function or the normal uh, number of cells. Really the treatment that we have now that's widely available is treating symptoms. We don't have reliable or effective protective therapy, nor do we have effective restorative therapy. That's all the research. Unfortunately, there have been many, many failed disease modifying or neuroprotective trials. You can just scan this slide. Many drugs, many proposed mechanisms of action studied with many different um, study designs. All of these have failed in thousands of patients in literally billions of dollars uh, invested. Fortunately though, we are still seeing uh, treatment trials uh, being undertaken and the treatment trials can be subdivided under those directed at alpha-synuclein, for example, antibodies against synuclein, um, vaccines directed at al alpha-synuclein. Treatments against mechanisms, remember that cartoon of all of the different mechanisms, calcium channels, um, mitochondria, inflammation, et cetera. So treatment directed at these mechanisms distinct from synuclein. Treatments against various genes, remember all of those genes that I showed you that can contribute to synuclein. And so there are many genes, remember the um, uh, LARC2, for example, I didn't tell you about glucocerebrosidase, another very important gene. So there are treatments directed at genetic subtypes. And then invent, invent interventions directed at disease modifying effects, not specifically influencing the biology. So for example, um, in increasing certain enzymes in the brain that make more dopamine or treatments to increase the number of cells, transplants, et cetera, or trophic factors. This is a slide just summarizing some of the agents under phase one to phase three trials. So these are not treatments just in animal models or in cell culture. These are actually treatments that are now being studied in humans. So it's very exciting. This is really an active field and we're really looking forward to some of the results, for example, of some of the monoclonal antibody trials or some of the treatments designed to treat genetic subgroups. 
But there are many obstacles to establishing successive, successful neuroprotection. And unfortunately, we still don't know the cause. Uh, there are many different mechanisms, as I've told you, and we don't know when these kick in. We don't know whether some of them predominate. We don't know in whom some of them predominate and some don't. We really lack very good animal models. We lack the ability to know whether our treatments engage the target that they're directed towards. In many of those failed studies, we don't know whether we failed because the treatment failed or what, whether we used the right dose or whether we used the right measure of outcome. We lack, remember I showed, told you of the importance of the biomarkers, we're now beginning to see the development of good biomarkers, but we really need a lot more. And there's always this concern that you've um, closed the barn door after the horse has bolted from the barn from the farmyard. Uh, maybe we've started the treatment too late. And this is an important consideration that myself and others have been emphasizing: that Parkinson's probably is not a single disease. And when we treat all patients as if they've got the same condition, this reductionist approach may be an important reason for failure. And so this is a cartoon that really emphasizes that our old approach, lumping many individuals as if they've got the same disease, when in fact they've got many different diseases, lumping them all together with a one treatment fits all, one size fits all, a single drug for all of these patients is probably a reason for failure. Some of them would have benefited but most of them would have had no effect or even adverse effects. And maybe when we combine all of these patients, we fail to see the small proportion that would have benefited. Whereas if we can separate patients out, maybe by biomarkers or other measures and only treat those patients where we know we're going to succeed, will we actually truly succeed and eliminate these other patients from these early treatments. So we recognize, remember I started emphasizing this very broad heterogeneity. It's not a single uniform disorder, it's a complex disease. And so we need to recognize that if we combine all of these different uh, causes of Parkinson's and think that some sort of miracle occurs resulting in the clinical manifestations, we're never going to find it because it's not a single miracle. It's many different, ways of getting to the final outcome. And so our researchers really need to recognize all of these mechanisms, subdivide our patients if we're going to be successful. So I think because of time, I'm going to skip through this. I'm really reaching the end. There are many different questions and challenges ahead. Should we continue to approach large numbers of patients now? Maybe, it's, maybe we shouldn't continue. Maybe we should only continue with single enriched populations like single genes. Maybe we should be treating people at the earliest stages and not when they've already developed the manifestations. Should we target very specific um, therapies uh, to different subtypes? And how should we do that with different new designs or new outcome measures? So I think, again, I'll apologize, I've gone on a little long, and so let's come down to the, my final points. I was going to review some of the new therapies, but I think because of time, I think well, what I'm going to do is emphasize that we've got a number of later stage Parkinson's problems that our treatment needs to be taking into account, not just the dopamine motor features, it's non-dopaminergic manifestations that we need to also concentrate on. And so, this is a final concept that I introduced quite a long time ago, thinking of Parkinson's disease in different eras. The pre-levodopa era is basically what James Parkinson described. The levodopa era was when levodopa was introduced in 1970, and we're now on a non-dopaminergic era. The pre-levodopa era was all the dopamine features that overwhelmed patients. The levodopa era is all the motor complications, the dyskinesias and motor fluctuations with people living longer and now us recognizing the non-dopamine features and all those non-motor features. And then our current and future um, era 
is recognizing and having to deal with all of the features that are non-dopaminergic. So let's conclude. James Parkinson described the dopamine features. People didn't live long enough to recognize all of the non-dopaminergic multi-systems for features. We're now recognizing that we have to diagnose Parkinson's very early, even before the manifestations of dopamine. And we're also gonna have to deal with the late manifestations. Our novel therapeutics will depend on advances in understanding the disease, its pathogenesis, its progression, and developing reliable biomarkers. And I think we're really on a verge of very unique and novel biomarkers. And where are we headed? Making that diagnosis much earlier and then it, using that early diagnosis and then being able to apply reliable uh, therapeu therapeutics. We're going to be manifest or managing the mid-stage disease far more effectively. And I apologize, I really didn't get to some of the um, treatments such as deep brain stimulation and others that are really quite effective. And then late stage, we're recognizing that many of the features that we now recognize are Parkinson's disease really wouldn't have been recognized by James Parkinson. And so remember I told you the possessive, I think we're no longer dealing with what James Parkinson's would have recognized and we have to get away from that concept. So I apologize for that very rapid uh, approach to the last part of the talk. Uh, thanks for your um, um, patience with that and I'll uh, entertain any questions in this last few minutes. Well, thank you, Dr. Lang. It was very informative and uh, uh, you're quite correct. We, we would be very interested in hearing more of what you had to say there, uh, but we do uh, need to try to keep on time. So thank you for that. So we do have a number of questions uh, uh, from the participants. Uh, the first one is, uh, in a family of eight, two of us have Parkinson's disease. How important is a loss of the sense of smell as a possible precursor, given that a few of us lost this sense in our teenage years? Yeah, that's uh, a very interesting observation. It certainly suggests that this uh, family does har harbor uh, an important gene. Unfortunately, not all families where there are multiple members are we able to find genes that we recognize currently. It tells us that there are many more genes that still haven't been discovered, or maybe it's, as I told you, that genetic load that the family has and not just the single gene. Um, as you've mentioned, loss of sense of smell may be an early manifestation. It's probably not a risk. It may very well be an early manifestation of the disease, although some people still believe it could be a risk and that, that uh, it then allows people to be um, more in contact with environmental factors. Maybe they don't avoid certain environmental factors that could be contributing because they don't sense them through their olfactory mechanism. But again, most people think that it's a, a form of the disease and it probably was a manifestation in those individuals. Uh, how early? We hear a lot of patients say it occurs decades before. The studies that have been done suggest it's actually occurring just before, maybe within the first, the four years before the manifestation of the disease, but it's clearly quite variable. Thank you, Dr. Lang. Uh, we have another one. I think it's really about the contagiousness of uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, if researchers can give Parkinson's uh, to lab monkeys, why can't people give it to each other or might they? So I think it's clearing up the um, how the researchers give it to the monkeys. That's a really great question. There is no evidence that Parkinson's is catching or infectious. Um, the idea that the abnormal protein can encourage the misfolding of the normal protein is very well established, I believe. However, there have been multiple attempts at uh, uh, looking at whether Parkinson's is uh, infectious and whether people exposed to others with Parkinson's have a higher incidence. There's, for example, no evidence for people married to an individual with Parkinson's having a higher incidence of Parkinson's. Conjugal Parkinson's certainly exists. I have many couples with Parkinson's in my practice, but that's probably more a coincidence given how common Parkinson's is. 
rather than Parkinson's being infectious and caught from one individual to another. So I don't think we should be worried about that. Uh, and I guess, Dr. Lang, just to clarify that the researchers actually injected the yeah. uh, uh, Parkinson's into the lab monkeys' brains. So yeah. and it's a very, quite very a different high, situation. Yeah, and a very high concentration of the abnormal protein was required. It's not the kind of thing you'd be exposed to in a regular environment or in contact with a person with Parkinson's. And we have an interesting question um, about the abnormal protein. Uh, can it be detected in a urine test? No, it seems that urine probably doesn't contain sufficient amounts of abnormal protein. There's not been a lot of studies on urine, but it doesn't look like there's going to be a lot of excretion of the abnormal protein in the urine. On the other hand, it certainly seems that it's in the cerebrospinal fluid, which obviously bathes the brain. And as I mentioned, what I'm very excited by is its presence outside the brain um, because we may be able to use that more efficiently for diagnosis. Not everybody is, wants to have their spinal tap to make a diagnosis, whereas a very simple skin biopsy, for example, if we can confirm these original observations, a skin biopsy is very simple. Any physician can do a skin biopsy. Here's a, another interesting one, as you uh, talked a bit about markers and being able to diagnose the disease earlier. If uh, diagnosis uh, was able to occur earlier, how would the treatment differ? Right now it wouldn't. And so I'm not, in, I'm not encouraging or invoking the idea that everybody needs to go out and get a skin biopsy. What I'm saying is that within the uh, confines or structure of research studies, skin biopsies may vary. Number one, let's say if you present with features that could be related to Parkinson's and you really need to know whether you have Parkinson's disease or not, then a skin biopsy could be very important in confirming and differentiating Parkinson's disease from other conditions which it could be confused with. So that's the first thing in diagnosis of symptomatic patients. Second, in the situation of research, being able to diagnose this condition very early as new experimental therapies are being studied, this will be very important because you need to know, number one, that the people participating in the trial actually have the disease of interest. And number two, it may be that we'll be able to use that marker as an outcome, as a measure of the success of the therapy. We don't have that yet, but many of us are hoping that it may be used in that fashion as well. So right now, making a diagnosis before any symptom occurred, no, I'm not proposing that at all. It needs to be used within uh, research uh, as a research tool. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, there's a couple other questions. I think we have time for at least one. Uh, this is very specific, but it goes back to the gut. Uh, so if you have a gut infection that possibly leads to Graves' disease, is it possible it could become Parkinson's disease? Well, I'm, I'll be honest, I don't, I'm not aware of gut infections inducing Graves' disease. Um, certainly gut inflammation is thought to be important and there is some evidence of uh, a higher incidence of Parkinson's disease in inflammatory bowel diseases. And there's a lot of interest in other inflammations of the gut that may predispose. And this goes along with some of those things that I was telling you about with the microbiome. So, uh, and there's an interest in inflammatory diseases in the gut, making what's called a leaky gut, a leaky bowel that then allows these um, uh, certain forms of fatty acids and other factors to get into the blood that then may change the, the brain environment. So many different ways that bowel inflammation may influence. Um, it's far from straightforward. There's a lot of interest in the microbiome, as I've told you of Parkinson's, but there's a lot of research on the microbiome that is very flawed. And the more I learn about the microbiome, the more I realize how complex it is. And it's not just what bacteria you actually have in the gut, because in fact, that can change. That can change if you're taking probiotics, it, they can change based on where you live, based on your 
a dietary intake. And so this concept of a simple Parkinson's microbiome is very naive and very flawed. Thank you very much, Dr. Lang. Uh, that does complete our time allotted for this plenary. So we really appreciate you taking time out of your day. It was uh, very uh, informative and your expertise was fabulous. So thank you once again, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks very much, thanks for your attention. Again, I apologize for rushing through the last part. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to be able to stay for the next lecture. So please have a great day and hope you learn a lot.